Complexity Information Standards TADWIG 2020 Conference. This is our contributed oral session one. Never mind that CO2 was already held on Monday. I'm your moderator, Kate Ingenloff, and I'm super lucky to have an awesome support group here today, including my co moderators, Holly Little and pa um, Paula Zemulio. I'm sorry, I totally butchered your last name. Sorry, Paula. Uh, and Ellie Wallace and Holly Little rocking the Zoom tech support. Thank you for joining us and thank you for all the speakers that are he uh, here today for the session. We have five great talks lined up for you today. Each talk will be 10 minutes with approximately five minutes for questions and a few minutes to transition to the next speaker. If all goes well um, and as planned, we should have time at the end of the session for general discussion. You're welcome to enter questions into the chat um, or perhaps more ideally into the session Google Doc. Also, please feel free to add your name and institution to the sheet as well. We do ask that you keep your microphones muted for the entire presentations. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other, other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled completely. Uh, for further information, please see our code of conduct documentation. All right, so full disclosure, tonight's session will be recorded for later viewing of the Tadwig YouTube page or on the, on the Tadwig YouTube page. And finally, please bear with any technical difficulties we may have. Be sure to thank all of the volunteers and session organizers and enjoy today's event. So let's go ahead and get started. First and foremost, we'd like to welcome Mr. Arthur Chapman. Thank you so much, Arthur, and the screen is yours. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. <clears throat> Welcome everybody, whatever time of the day it is for you. Um, today we're talking about uh, three new documents um, on georeferencing. I'd like to thank my co-authors for this as well, John Majoric, Paula Zamoglio, Maria Celeste Luna and Dave Bloom. Okay, the first one of these is georeferencing best practices. Now, some of you may remember back in 2006, the BioGeomancer community um, published the best practices for georeferencing. This is a complete rewrite. It's based largely on the earlier document and other documents. It's published by GBIF. It's using a new method that GBIF has developed for publishing their documents. It's using ASCII docs on GitHub. And the documents will continue to live as live versioned documents. And so they can be updated continually. And then intermittently, archived versions will be published in PDF format. All documents have DOIs. And at the moment, the three documents I'm talking about are open for community review until the 1st of November. You can see the link there and Paul has put a link into the document as well, the associated document with these talks. And at the bottom of each of the slides are the DOIs for the, um, the document I'm talking about and they're also in the associated document. So the georeferencing best practices provides a guideline to the best practices for georeferencing. And although targeted specifically at biological occurrence data and museum herbarium data, it's also available for anybody that uh, any other discipline that uses spatial interpretation of location. And this is particularly important for citizen science and the use, use of um, uncertainty and, and uh, coordinates, etc., cetera, in, in the observational data. This document brings best practices up to date with new terms, technologies, and georeferencing recommendations. And it's designed so that institutions can extract portions that apply to them, uh, to their own requirements and priorities and develop their own documents. And several agencies have done this in the past and we, we encourage people to do this, to extract those parts, create a new document, reference this document, but not call it the best practices. 
So this document is a complete revision with many new and updated references. The major changes and additions in this edition include a ref redefined the term extent to mean a distance area or volume within defined boundaries and added the term radial to cover the sense of the term extent, which was used in previous documents. So for example, in, in the illustration A, the little gray part there is the part that um, was, would now be called extent and in B, the C would be the radial, which was used to be called extent in previous documents. We've also introduced the term corrected center to replace geographic center. And this is important change because the geographic center did not always yield the minimum uncertainty due to the extent of the feature, the corrected center does. So for example, if you've got a record sitting here in the ocean, it's moved to the land there in B um, and the new um, circle is, is created to, to cover all the extent of the collection with the center based on the piece that's in, on actually within the boundaries of the uh, extent. We've also expanded sections on elevation and updated them on recording elevations and determining the uncertainty due to elevation based on the accuracy of GPSs and, and digital elevation made, uh, models. We've looked at how accurate altimeters are and how you make sure that your altimeter is always recording the most accurate. Uh, we've looked at maps, uh, how you determine uh, how accurate the elevation is on maps on different GPS receivers, uh, looked at vertical datums and, and how different datums may affect your elevation. Um, mentioned digital elevation models and digital terrain models to determine elevation. For example, um, if you're determining some of these, if, if there's a heavy snow cover, for example, um, what's the true elevation? Sometimes it, it the, the radar penetrates through the, the snow cover to the land and other times you might get reflection off the snow cover, for example. We've looked particularly at smartphones and how accurate the, how accurate the elevation is on smartphones. And we've looked at this, um, we've started working on checking this in various different parts of the world. And for, for example, if you've got um, good SBAS systems, in, for example, America or Australia, you can get fairly accurate elevation from your smartphone. But if you go to other areas, and I was looking at places in, in Fiji, for example, and at virtually the sea level, we were looking at um, a difference between minus 56 meters to plus 60 meters on repeated observations of elevation. So where you don't have good SBAS systems, your elevation on a smartphone or a GPS for that matter is not all that accurate. We've also um, talked about the difference between uh, using mean sea level, using the geoid or using the ellipsoid of the earth. And this uh, illustration there, you can see the um, difference between the geoid based mean sea level and the ellipsoid and it can be quite, quite variable. We've also looked at how accurate elevation is if you're pulling it off from Google Earth, for example, and make recommendations there on what you should use. We've also expanded and added information on other GPS satellites. The previous documents all deal with just GPS, which is the US based system, but now we've included other uh, global systems such as the um, Russian, Chinese, European, Italian, uh, Indian rather, and Japanese. Um, we've looked at the use of smartphones and cameras to record GPS locations and elevations. And I just working with my own GPS cam, uh, based camera the other day, I realized you can set the update time. So from a second, up to five minutes. So if you're walking around taking lots of photos 
over a five minute period and you have your update. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, um, it, sorry, threw me off. Uh, sorry. Uh, your, uh, your variations in your um, coordinates will be wrong. Okay, I'll, I'll flick through the others. We've added a lot of ecological marine information using transects, irregular paths, grids, etc., and looked at bathymetry and underwater depths. Um, it conforms to standards, uh, including the FAIR principles. It has very detailed glossary, which is worth its weight in gold on its own. For example, uh, the one there on altitude on the left, and it's uh, live linked throughout the document. So wherever you've got a, a term that might be in the glossary, it's linked in the document. You click on that and you go straight to the, um, to the glossary. The second one is a quick reference guide. And this is what a lot of people will use. And it, it, it um, helps you determine your georeference, particularly from old data, legacy data, herbarium museum data, and uh, it is fully illustrated and it's, it's based on the point radius method. It helps you determine the boundaries of the features and the shape, et cetera, and then the radial and the uh, corrected center. It's a step-by-step -step guide, um, georeferencing location types. This is just an example. Determine the boundaries, determine the coordinates and the radial, calculate the following information using the calculator. It's very heavily illustrated um, and helps you determine in each of the complicated areas how, how to uh, find the, the center and the radial. And there's live links throughout the document to the georeferencing best practices for more detailed information and the georeferencing calculator and the calculator manual. Um. So, Okay, just quickly, the third one is the georeferencing calculator manual. And this, a lot of people use the georeferencing calculator and the manual goes into that. Um, so the documents are fully integrated, the three documents, along with the georeferencing calculator and they're open for community review until the 1st of November, 2020. And that's the link to it. Thank you. Yeah. Stop share. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arthur. Do we have any questions from the audience? Maybe everybody's trying to think up some good ones for you. We encourage people to go in and, and look at those and make any comments because we'd prefer to have any comments or changes or everything anything done before we publish the volume, the volumes. Um, so people, please go in and, and um, make your comments on that. We do have one question that is currently being typed into the document. Oh, here's one in the chat um, from Matt Yoder. Is there a maximum error radius beyond which we can't do useful science? That's um, a question more on, on the use and it depends on the uh, use that you want to put the, the data to. So there may be uses where a very large uncertainty still doesn't make the data unusable. For example, if you've got a record that all it says is Tasmania, so you have a huge uncertainty circle and all you're wanting to do is make a list of the taxa in Tasmania, then that may be a perfectly good record, but it may not be a good record for other uses. So it really depends on the, on the use and record it, whatever it is. Richard, the, um, the GitHub link is in the associated document that um, we've put up for these talks uh, and will be on the slide as well. All right, it looks like we've, we've got one from Debbie Paul. So how might we use something like 
uh, hypothesis is, wait, oh, okay, I'm trying to read what you're. That's right. Is that right? Like hypothesis.is so that we across the world can comment on the same guide and see each other's insights. Yes, that's all on the, it's all done through the GitHub. Um, if you go to that link on the, um, the community review, you go on that link and there's a link to each of the three documents and there's an explanation there how you can make comments and they go into the GitHub so anybody can see them and um, we'll respond to them and or change the document accordingly before publication. Lee Belvin has asked if differential GPS is still relevant. Yes, and that's fully documented in the, in the document um, using differential GPS. And this, it also mentions the new systems that are coming online through GPSs, et cetera, around the world. And for example, in a, in a short time, uh, GPS accuracy in Australia will, will be within centimetres. So um, that's all documented and references as to where you can go to get further information on that data. On, and just one other quick thing, it is hoped that a lot of these documents will be translated into other languages over time and probably starting with the quick reference guide because it'll be used for a lot of training in different um, languages. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Kate. I was, say, I was saying, great, that sounds fantastic. Thank you so very much. This is, this is a, an excellent resource and hopefully everybody goes and before the November 1st deadline to, to provide some feedback. Let's see, does it look like, it looks like we might have one other question. There's one from Abby and one from William. All right, so from Abby Benson, would it make sense to also publish to the Ocean Best Practices system? That sounds like it, it would be a good idea. It's probably something to talk to GBIF with. It'll be D, uh, DOI, so you can make links to these. We have looked at um, um, marine specific things, how you, you record dive events and things like that, and also looked at bathymetry. Um, so um, yes, and, and we're hoping that everybody in all communities will use this and we get more standard. Um, what's Williams? Uh, yes, this, this William Lee would document guide you on the way to improve calculations if done with previous practices. Um, yes, and, and, and the, the documents will guide you through how to do do all that, and particularly the the uh, quick reference guide. It's a very clear step-by-step -step guide for all the different types of uh, location, locality types. And um, you know, whether you're in a cave or in the ocean or on land or whatever, it will give you step-by-step -step guides on how you determine the centre, um, the corrected centre and the geographic radial. Great. We've got another minute or so if anybody has uh, one last burning question for Arthur or let's see. Let me check the sheet if there's any others that we missed. All right. Well, it looks like we've got them all for the time being. We'll let the let the thoughts percolate through the next few few talks. Thank you so much, Arthur. Oh, sorry, William is William has just asked one question I can answer quickly. What improvements do the calculator has? Um, the calculator has been updated to conform with the new terminology. For example, not using extent, but using radial, etc. It's also added a lot of new um, 
um, datums and EPSG um, records in there so that you can convert from different um, datums, etc. But it's it's clearer and updated, and uh, they're all integrated integrated exactly together so that if you're using one the terminology and and the glossaries all work together uh, and john's just added there that the calculator also adds uncertainties using google maps and google earth all right well excellent well thank you so much arthur and I guess at this point, we should take a second and do a quick break and record.